Thank you so much. My goodness. I just want to uh, just say a few words briefly about what Socrates in the City is, uh, and then I want to introduce um, my guest, our guest tonight, Dr. Stephen Meyer. So, some of you already know what Socrates in the City is, and if you do, how many of you are familiar with Socrates in the City? Raise your hand. Okay, you guys can go out and take your cigarette break if you, uh, if you want to. Thank you. Um, Socrates in the City. Some of you know that Socrates uh, said the unexamined life is not worth living, and that he blew his brains out in an alley. All right, you knew that was a joke. All right, great, great, great. Uh, uh, he said the unexamined life is not worth living. And I think um, I live in Manhattan, you know, cultural capital of the world. And the cultural capitals of the world, they don't talk about the big questions. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah, that you don't bring those things up at cocktail parties. You know what a cocktail party is? <laughs> I, you know, two hours out of the city, I'm taking nothing for granted, okay? <laughs> uh, how many of you own chickens? Raise your hands. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know. You think I'm stupid? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. How many of you churn butter? Come on. How many of you wear long jean skirts? No? That's a bridge too far? All right. Um, <laughs> so I thought, who can we get for this Pennsylvania event? And uh, I thought, what about a former geophysicist? Um, can we get him? Some of you know the story uh, of, of Stephen Meyer. Maybe he'll tell a little bit. Um, he has his PhD in philosophy of science from Cambridge. Uh, and I, I cannot really introduce him at this point without saying that he's been really instrumental in my own journey. My book, which uh, I'm happy to say I'm not here to talk about tonight, uh, it's called Is Atheism Dead? And I deal with some of the things on a, on a different level than, than Stephen, but I, I deal with some of these issues. Uh, I don't call it the God hypothesis, which he does, but ultimately, that's what it is. And, and Steve has been uh, central in, in helping me think some of this through. Um, and tonight, uh, I'm going to be talking to him about his new book, The Return of the God Hypothesis. Some of you know his previous books, Darwin's Doubt uh, and Signature in the Cell. Anybody familiar with, with, with any of those books? Who are you people? <laughs> Why are you here? Uh, it's my privilege, in any case, to, to introduce now my friend, to ask him to come up, Dr. Stephen Meyer. Stephen, please come on up. <laughs> Thank you. Have a seat here. We're, uh, we're both mic'd up, so be careful what you say. Um, and uh, I'm not kidding, I really did interview Mel Gibson today, and I'm slightly less intimidated now in talking to you, but only slightly. Um, I, I sat next to the person who was doing the... Churning the butter. Churning the butter, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think you've insulted pretty much everyone That's already. my goal, yeah. that's my goal. The fact of the matter is that... Uh, I'm thrilled, thrilled to be here and thrilled for the whole conference. And I was really thrilled that we got to, to do a Socrates in the City event, as we're calling this, um, at the beginning of the conference. Because it is true, you uh, and this book have, have really helped me think things through. So I, I was trying to think where to start. I, I interviewed you before, way before the book came out in Dallas uh, at a conference similar to this one. And now the book has been out. And uh, I'm, I think I said it way back then, I, I'm excited at the idea, this is maybe where to start, that science is inescapably, and I want to say that loudly and in italic bold underscored, inescapably pointing to God. Uh, you call it the return of the God hypothesis. So maybe we can start with how, what has the reaction been to the book? Because you are somebody that you, you, you speak and live in the academy. You, you get to hear from people that uh, uh, don't share our views. So what, what has some of the response been to this book? I, I think there's a big story here. The, the story that I tell in the book is, 
connects to conversations that are going on right now. Um, the, the story of the book is that in the period we call the scientific revolution, that belief in God played a huge role in the rise of modern science. There were theological understandings about the nature of, of the natural world, about uh, the orderliness and design of the natural world that made science possible, that made the natural world intelligible to the human intellect, our minds having been made in the image of the same creator who made the rationality and design and order of the world. We lost that view in the 19th century, and it's begun to come back. And it's coming back not in spite of science, but because of science. And so when you explain that that's your story, that's the argument of the book, uh, it inevitably connects to people who are wrestling with those exact same questions. And what I've found is that... um, I, we had a, you know, had a lot of nice endorsements of the book. Uh, there were seven or eight titled professors of science at major universities who endorsed it. I even got an endorsement from a Nobel laureate. But what was, what's been most interesting is the private conversations that have ensued as the, as the result of the book, sometimes with young people, sometimes with colleagues who thought they would never be interested in the big questions, but were never really satisfied with the materialistic answer that they were getting, the idea that in the beginning or from, from eternity past were the particles, and the particles arranged themselves into the more complex chemicals, and they arranged themselves by undirected Dar- Darwinian means into all the forms of life we see today. And then into more, us. And then Having eventually this conversation. To, to, to us. And there's always been something, I think, for a lot of people that's been missing in that conversation. And so writing a book like this, creates an, the opportunity for those. And I've, had, I've been on uh, some, a really wide variety of shows. Uh, one that's called the Eric Metaxas Show. There's a little odd. Oh, yeah. Um, but um, that is the first time I got to make a he's joke at your the, expense. This a, hasn't I, happened before. This is, well, this is the good thing, is that I, I am, I'm bold enough to be foolish <laughs> enough so it kind of makes people feel comfortable with being foolish and, you know, sort of insulting in the way that you just were. <laughs> so I just want to say... God is using me. But, so, uh, um, some of the interviews uh, that stand out, I had one with Michael Shermer, the, the editor of Skeptic Magazine. I thought it would be a you know, half hour, an hour. It went two hours. It was a really in-depth, very mutually respectful conversation. See, now kinda... that's very interesting because I don't know a, a lot of these figures in the world of, you know, the, the, they're, they're known atheists, they're known uh, skeptics, but the idea that you would have a civil conversation, not that you, but that he would want to have a civil conversation about this and would, that's actually, in the world in which we live, th- that's a big deal. Yeah. Like that, that, that he would be respectful. Of- I think there's something shifting in the intellectual world. Around 2006, 2007, we had the first uh, spate of these books that were titled uh, under the genre of the new atheism. Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, the sort of in-your-face a- atheism that was expressing not only the idea that science properly understood undermines belief in God, but, gee, that's also a good thing. we we got to get rid of this God idea from the culture. I think fast forward about 15 years, and here we are. We have a lot of what I... I I did a a piece in the Jerusalem Post last summer about the passing of Steven Weinberg, who was one of those aggressive scientific atheists. He was famous for saying the more the universe seems comprehensible, meaning to our science, the more it seems pointless. That kind of point of view, I think, is on the wane. And there are a lot of people who are intellectuals, who are still non-believers, but who are lamenting the loss of a religious mooring for our culture. I think about people like uh, Jordan Peterson, who's so interesting to listen to as he wrestles with these questions so authentically, or uh, Tom Holland, the British historian, uh, or, now, he wrote the book Dominion. Dominion, yeah, very interesting book. It's, 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 I mean, I'm probably speaking for most people here that if you're familiar with Jordan Peterson or Tom Holland, you, you kind of find it hard to believe that they're not Christians. How could they not be knowing what they know? Yeah, you get the sense they're teetering, but there, there's a, a whole class of intellectuals who I think would like to believe but can't quite get themselves over the line. And yet, I think unbelief in our culture arose as a pervasive phenomenon in the late 19th century with the rise of figures like Darwin and Marx and Freud 
And I think those intellectual influences are something of a spent force now. That's, the, that's the, the, the argument of the book, is that the new discoveries of science about the universe having a beginning or about the fine-tuning that makes life possible or about the discovery of digital code and a complex information storage, transmission, and processing system inside the cell, these sort of things were not expected from the point of view of good old-fashioned 19th century scientific materialism or expected by people like Dawkins, who framed the issues very helpfully. Dawkins said, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if at bottom there's no purpose, no design, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And in, in the book, I take him at his word and say, is that, really tr- is that really the case? Did materialism, did blind, pitiless forces expect a, a beginning to the universe or the exquisite fine-tuning that makes life possible or the exquisite complexity of the cell? I don't think so. I don't think it did. Well, I, I mean, when you're talking about these different figures, as you know, because we've talked about this, but when I finally dared to, to read some of what Dawkins or Hitchens wrote, I was mystified at the level of what I saw as nothing less than intellectual dishonesty, incredible sloppiness. I really was astonished. I expected better, in a way. And I thought that they, they must know that they're playing a game. They're people that I can take seriously, who are wrestling, and I honor them as they wrestle. But, but the, the so-called new atheists seemed to me to be dramatically out of their depth when it came to philosophizing about these things. And what amazes me, in a way, is that they got away with it. It's, it's like they were looking for undergraduate applause, like that was the bar that they were setting. And they really didn't care if smart people could see that there's nothing to this. I've always really appreciated uh, several of the new atheists, Dawkins in particular, for, the, for his talent for framing issues. In fact, the quote I just used is a beautiful framing device because it really it allows you to answer a really fundamental question if the question is posed right. He says, basically the question is, does the universe look as it should if it's the product of blind, undirected, pitiless processes, right. or also known as scientific materialism, the worldview thereof, or does it look as you'd expect if there was a purposeful intelligence behind it all? And I think that framing is incredibly productive for the conversation. I just think he's completely wrong. Okay, but, let, let's, yeah. and let's start with why. In, in the book, the three main issues that you bring up in, in The Return of the Guy, God Hypothesis, if I remember correctly, because it's been a while, yeah. it's the Big Bang. The Big Bang, or the, the, the Big Bang is the theory that synthesizes evidence from observational astronomy and developments in theoretical physics. And the two together point to sometimes called the singularity or a beginning to the universe. Okay. And that was incredibly surprising discovery of, tw- of, of 20th century science. Right, okay, so, let, so let's start with that. How can someone like Richard Dawkins make the statement that, that he made, which you just quoted, given what we now know? Um, you know, that, that uh, in, the, in the first millionth of a second after the Big Bang, and it's always funny when you're talking about the first millionth of a second after the Big Bang, like there's not enough time for after, is there? But, um, but that within no time almost, we know the four fundamental forces in physics were established forever. How can somebody like a Dawkins, who is a scientist, imagine that that happened without a designer. What, what, well, th- what could get him to say a thing? Th- that's like where that? I, I, I agree with you. That's where I think the bluff comes in. Okay. The, the issue's framed beautifully, but the key evidence that helps adjudicate the question is not really taken head on. Dawkins doesn't really address this question of cosmic beginnings, but it's a crucially um, challenging piece of data for his point of view. Uh, uh, Carl Sagan in his famous Cosmos series you know, was quoted as saying, the universe is all there is, all there ever was, all there ever will be. The materialistic or naturalist credo is the idea that matter and energy are the eternal self-existent things and that they play the role of what philosophers sometimes call the prime reality, the thing from which everything else comes, in the same way that God plays that role in a, in, in a theistic worldview or theistic framework. But the evidence of cosmology, the evidence of astronomy and astrophysics, is not pointing to a material universe that has been here from eternity past, but rather a a universe that had a definite beginning. 
and as Robert Dickey, the uh, famous uh, Princeton physicist, said, an infinitely old universe would relieve us of the necessity of explaining the origin of matter at any finite time in the past. But a finite universe, the, the, the sequel to that is, but a finite universe does not relieve us of that necessity. And the problem for materialists is that if the physical world of matter, space, time, and energy have a beginning, then before that or prior to that causally, there was no matter to do the causing. The, so and that's the problem. And this is it where is it not becomes funny. Fixed. So yeah. when somebody says there's matter uh, and that's all there is and all there ever has been, you think, how, where are you getting that from? That is a decidedly unscientific statement made by somebody speaking in the name of science. So it, it just feels to me like there's been like tons of bluster uh, and that they have they've painted themselves into an uncomfortable corner because if you follow the science, the science has increasingly been pointing to God. And now, I don't know how you see it as anything but open and shut. I mean, in, in your book, you talk about that. You talk about, uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember, you talk about abiogenesis in the middle? Yep, absolutely. And then the, and then the DNA coding, right? Yeah. What do folks on that side say? I mean, l let's talk a little bit about abiogenesis. I mean, tell, tell us what that is, because I imagine there are some people here who, who aren't familiar with that. But that, to me, is just outrageously compelling. Yeah, um, there are three big, big discoveries that I address in the book. The origin of the universe itself, it's fine, the origin of its finely tuned structure. You're talking about those four laws of physics that were set from the very beginning. And those parameters were set against all odds within very narrow tolerances to make life possible. And that's the, the fine-tuning problem. We can come back to that. Yeah. And then the third is this question of getting life from non-life, or abiogenesis. And this, is, this was the field of my, my PhD dissertation. I did it on origin of life biology. And it was clear by the late 80s, when I was working, that the field had come to a com place of complete impasse. In fact, my, one of my Cambridge supervisors said, Every, everybody when, when we, she, she said, when we go to these origin of life society meetings, every, our, she said, our field is becoming dominated by, by, by quacks. She said, because everybody in the field knows that everybody else's idea won't work, but they won't admit it about their own. And so it's the, the big question is, how do you get from brute chemistry in a prebiotic soup or a, a favorable ocean environment or a hydrothermal vent or whatever to a living cell with all the intricacies that we now observe including the digital code that's stored in the DNA that directs the construction of the proteins and the protein machines that are needed to keep cells alive. The more complex, the more we've learned about the complexity of life, the harder it is to explain by reference to simple, simple chemistry. And that gap between code, or between chemistry and code in our experience is only bridged by one and only one type of cause, and that's programmers, intelligent agents. So the discovery, I think, of digital code at the foundation of life is a powerful indicator of the activity of designing intelligence in the history of life, in the origin of life. And that's, I, I in the book, argue that as an inference to the best explanation, but I was having a, a conversation with a colleague today saying, on that, on that topic, we stand in no risk of contradiction because there is no better explanation being offered by those who are formulating chemical evolutionary theories of abiogenesis. The field is in a complete disarray. Well, j just to break it down again, because I don't know uh, what people here know or don't know, but I mean, I, I dealt with this in, in my book, so I can at least understand this. It's not like I, I say, I know nothing and explain it to me, but, but break it down for folks here. Talk about Miller-Urey and you know, what people were thinking, let's say, 70 years ago. If we go back 70 years and somebody says, I believe in science, and I think science can tell us how the universe, through random processes, produced life. So wh where were we in 1952, and how complex did we think the simplest life was? I mean, if we go back, it, just to give them the benefit of the doubt of why they believed that this could just happen randomly. Yeah, there, there's a huge historical irony here, because... In 1953, Watson and Crick right. elucidate the double helical structure of the DNA molecule. In the same year, Miller-Urey are able to synthesize a couple of the 
protein-forming amino acids. And the one discovery, the two things, at the time people think, oh, science is making this great progress, even on these, these deep and fundamental questions about the origin of life. But what Watson and Crick discovered, and what was discovered subsequent to their first discovery, made, the, it made theories of the chemical evolutionary origin of life increasingly implausible, implausible in the extreme. What Miller and Urey were able to do was build what are called two little building blocks of proteins. Proteins are the large molecules in cells that form um, intricate three-dimensional shapes, and in virtue of those three-dimensional shapes, they're able to perform all kinds of interesting jobs, all the most important jobs in the cell. You can kind of think of, of proteins like the tools in your toolbox. There's a hammer, a wrench, a, a saw, and each one has a different function based on its, its, its form. And the proteins catalyze reactions in the cell at rates much faster than would ever occur. They're called en- the enzyme proteins. They're also proteins that, that will build the parts of miniature machines. So we have those little rotary engines that you may have seen about that Michael Behe has made famous, or little turbines, or little walking robotic motor proteins. There's all kinds of intricate nanotechnology in the cell, and that's all made of proteins. Although they didn't know about that in 1952. They didn't know about any of this When Miller-Urey did their yeah. famous experiment, right. and they said, whoa, we got amino acids, we're on our way, they didn't know a lot of the stuff that you were just talking about. So, so pe- it was very easy for right. them to say, well, well, we'll figure out how to, how to get to life. We're, we're not that far. Absolutely. And one of the things my, my, one of my uh, dissertation supervisors told me was that the more, com- the more we know about the nature of life, the harder it becomes to explain its origin. And so if we learn more and more about the complexity of life and the inner workings of the cell. So first, Watson and Crick elucidate the DNA. That's pretty interesting. But then in 1957... Crick has this amazing brainstorm. It's called the sequence hypothesis. And he proposes that the chemicals along the interior of the helix, we've got this helical mod- uh, uh, molecule, and it's, the outside is made of what's called a sugar phosphate backbone. We all knew that. <laughs> Tell us something we don't know, Steve. Come on. <laughs> sugar phosphate backbone. like. And on the inside, the business end, there are little bases called nucleotide bases that are functioning like alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters like the zeros and ones in a section of machine code. So what Crick realizes is that DNA is performing a function in virtue of its information carrying capability. That there's literally chemicals that are functioning like digital characters conveying information for building those proteins I was talking about a minute ago. The the, 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 The big toolboxes that do all the job in the cell. So an analogy that's pretty apt would be like uh, the technology that we know about for manufacturing, computer uh, CAD CAM, computer-assisted design and manufacturing. Up in, the Se- in Seattle, where we live, the Boeing plant, you'll have an engineer sitting at a console, write some code, goes down a line, a wire. It's translated into a machine code that can be read at a manufacturing center that might be used to put rivets on an airplane wing. You have something very like that going on inside the cell where you've got digital information directing the construction of these proteins. But, but you're telling me that Crick protein machines. figured this out in 57? In, he figures this See, out. See, this is, I, I, I'm surprised by that because I, I just think that that's. I can understand if we figured that out more recently. But the idea it, it was that a few stu- years stunning. after the Miller Urey experiment, they see this, what do they do? At that point, what did they do? What do you do with that kind of information? I don't, it was, for him, it was a hypothesis. He, it, it, interesting thing about Crick's background, it's absolutely fascinating. He wasn't a biologist. He was, he was, he was doing a PhD in physics when he teamed up with Watson in, in 52, 53. And he had been a code breaker in World War II. So he had a deep intu- intuitive understanding of what it took to transmit and store and even encode information. And so he realized fairly early on that DNA had all the features that were necessary for it to function as an encryption system, a a, a way of storing and transmitting information. And so this was a hypothesis in 57. Then there was a flurry of activity in French labs, in, in labs in the UK, on the US side, and now historians of science call this period the, the molecular biological revolution. And by about 1965, they had sorted out that Crick was in fact right. That's what, what he thought DNA was doing was what it was doing. It was, it was directing the construction of these fascinating protein 
large protein molecules that do all the important jobs in the cell. And then by that time, you already start to get real tension in the field of origin of life biology. What seemed an easy problem to solve in 1953, well, we got the amino acids. What could be simpler? Well, you have to get all the amino acids. There's not just two or three of them. There's 20 protein-forming amino acids. But you also got to get them to link up in the right way. And then you have to get them sequenced in the right way as well so they fold into the right three-dimensional shapes so that they can do jobs. And that's all got to be embedded in a larger information storage and processing system to actually produce what we now know as the simple cell. Okay, so why, when you understand how outrageously complex it is, and, and, and it sounds like that happened way before I thought it did. I mean, it's happening in the 50s and then in, in the mid-60s. They know this. How could they possibly have continued thinking that random processes delivered this complexity? How, how do you you know, tell yourself that when, when it's in front of you? I, I think this is where the story of, uh, th this is where worldview inter intersects. I think coming out of the 19th century, many leading scientists in all fields were default scientific materialists. They believed that matter and energy were the things from which everything else came. This is why Einstein was so initially resistant to the Big Bang Theory, by the way, is that his own, his own theory of general relativity was implying that, that gravity couldn't be the only force in the universe. According to, to Einstein, gravity curves space. And if the only force in the universe is gravity, drawing all the other matter together, you get one big lump of space and one infinitely tight curve, curvature of space around it. And, and there would be no room to put anything. We'd live in a giant black hole. But we don't live in a universe like that, so Einstein posited there must be an expansion force that's operating in opposition, an anti-gravity, what he called his cosmological constant. But that implied a dynamic universe moving outward from a beginning, which to him smacked to the doctrine of creation. And so he fiddled with his equations to try to... to uh, actually, you know, this is a good thing. This is something I actually do talk about <laughs> wherever I go because I find it so funny. What we're really talking about here is worldview, right? right. We're talking about the idea that there's all this evidence, but, but people on either side have, have decided things that are immovable. And so the, the, the materialists, have, they, they just know that there's no God, and we can't talk about that, we can't even think about that, so we'll just, we'll just skip that, and we'll just figure out what we need to figure out. But we know it's not that. And... What I find funny is that the greatest scientist, you know, since Newton, was himself so insecure as a scientist. I mean, it's almost funny to me that you'd think that anybody uh, could be guilty of worrying about what others think, but not Einstein. Well, I, and I'm Einstein not... was so scared of being tagged as a religious guy because of his, his equations point to the idea that the universe expanded from nothing, sounds too much like Genesis. So he nervously, you know, creates this fudge factor. Yeah, I'm not sure if it was in Einstein's case, a case of social anxiety. I think it was just the power of a default way of thinking. This was the way people, every, all thinking people uh, thought about things coming out of the 19th century. And so it was more of a reflexive, this can't possibly be the answer. It's got to be something that doesn't involve a beginning. But the, uh, part of the interesting story of, of, that I tell in the book is the story of these reversals. Einstein, by 1931, goes and views the evidence for himself at the, the Mount Wilson Observatory with Hubble. Uh, he's already been told about it in advance, so he's prepared. And he gives an interview to the New York Times two weeks later and says, well, you know, I guess I got this wrong. The universe isn't static. It is expanding. And he later said that... that the way he fiddled with his own equations to, to try to obscure that fact was the great, he said, the greatest blunder of my life. Hoyle, Did he say it in English? Like I, the reason I'm asking is because <laughs> I've, seen it, I've seen it translated, uh, or I've seen it phrased as, it was the greatest stupidity of my life, and others said it's the greatest blunder of my life. And I wonder uh, if he said it in German or in English. I, I don't know. It's a good question, Eric. I don't know. He may uh, have simply said, have, whoopsie daisy. Blunder, yeah. Right? <laughs> we don't know. But it, but it is funny, though, that it took him uh, 15 to 20 years to come to, to, to this come reckoning and, and to deal with And then the you have a, a very similar story with, with Fred Hoyle, who's a committed scientific materialist. 
he formulates the steady state cosmology, which is a, a variant on Einstein's idea of the static universe, defends it tenaciously, but he's very explicit in explaining that he formulated this because the alternative was a, a, an overtly theistic view and he was a scientific naturalist as a, as a matter of his philosophy. And then later he discovers some of the most compelling and interesting and improbable fine-tuning parameters, the ones that are necessary to account for the abundance of carbon in the universe, which is necessary for life. And he later changes his view to a kind of quasi-theistic position and says uh, the, the, the best data we have concerning the fine-tuning uh, are what we'd expect if uh, there was a super intellect that monkeyed with physics and chemistry. So he comes around. I actually had a conversation with him when I was still a grad student in Cambridge, and he'd come to talk about the, the origin of life problem. And afterwards, I chatted with him a bit and told him what, that I was working on this idea that DNA seemed to point to design, and he said, you know, come, come walk with me. And <laughs> we had this little walk down to the, the, the college uh, common room, and he said, yeah, if, if we could invoke intelligence, it would make explaining a lot of things a lot easier. And, when, you, when, you, when, yeah. you, when you said that he said, you know, come walk with me, I thought, you know, you'd end up dead or something <laughs> like that. Because he's like, we can't have people like you around here. Yeah. Um, you, I mean, the, st the story of Hoyle, maybe you can shed light on this. I don't know if you write about it in the book. I don't remember. But I found it fascinating that Hoyle was a, de he was dedicated to the idea that uh, you know the, the right way of thinking is that there is no God and the universe has been here forever. And he clung to that long past when others w you know, accepted the Big Bang. And we should say he coined the term Big Bang. He was speaking in a BBC interview in 1949 and speaking derisively. He, he meant it as a pejorative. Yeah, like, oh, yeah, that stupid Big Bang yeah. thing. And it's like, whoop, the, the term kind of caught on. Caught on. Yeah. And, um, but... I, as, as I read a little bit, I, I got the impression that he was maybe becoming more honest as the years passed. Oh, no question. I mean, he was, he was pretty much an advocate of the design hypothesis as, uh, as it applied to the fine-tuning problem. Which, and he was one of the scientists who, who formulated, or who made those discoveries. So early on, he was said that religion is but a desperate attempt to give people comfort and no wonder people get upset with people like me who tell them it's all an illusion. But later in his life, he's, he, he says uh, the best data we have are, are what we'd expect if a super intellect monkeyed with physics and chemistry. It was fine-tuning, suggested to him a fine-tuner. If, if you don't mind my asking you, because I, I, I wrote about it in my book, and it's your story. You told me the story of um, the conference you were at in 1985 and what happened, because I'm... Uh, I, I want folks to, to hear a little bit of your story, how you got involved in everything that you've been doing in the last uh, decades. C can you tell a bit about, about, about the story uh, with Hubble and, and your yeah, conference? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was a um, young scientist. I was working as a geophysicist for a local oil company in Dallas. Um, I had always been interested in the, in the big questions, as you were saying before, that were at the intersection between science and philosophy. So as an undergrad, I used to, I, I did a double major in physics and geology, largely at my father's urging to stick with the hard sciences, but uh, I always snuck over and took at least one philosophy class. Anyway, this conference came to Dallas, and it was called uh, Christianity Challenges the University, an international conference of atheists and theists. It sounded pretty intriguing. They had three panels, one on the origin of the universe, one on the origin of life, and one on the origin and nature of human consciousness. And the panels were stocked with people who were either self-identified theists in their worldview or self-identified scientific naturalists or materialists. And in the very first panel, uh, one of the most prominent speakers of the conference, Alan Sandage, a great cosmologist and astrophysicist. I mean, and I meant Sandage, not Hubble. Well, he, yeah. I mean, it's not a, uh, he worked for Hubble. He was yeah, Hubble's no, I know. graduate That's why student. I made so, a mistake, but yeah. So anyway, he went on to extend Hubble's research program and he'd been a long time well-known as an agnostic Jewish scientist. And at the conference, he announced a religious conversion, that he'd actually become a Christian. In 1985, he announces this at the conference. And explains that, that and then proceeded to give a talk on the evidence of, of the new cosmology, what we'd learned from multiple sources, the light coming from the distant galaxies, the cosmic background radiation, the, all the different key evidences for the Big Bang or the idea that the universe had a beginning. And then I, re I remember him, you know, he was 
not, in, in a way, he was not very happy about having this, this need to change his worldview thrust upon him. But that's where he, so he was a sort of very grave sort of figure. And he said, here is evidence for, for what can only be described as a super space natural event. There's no way this, meaning the evidence we have at the beginning of the universe, could have been explained or, or, or predicted within the realm of physics as we know it. And of course, that's, what, that's the same point I was making before. You can't explain the origin of the physical world physically, because before there was a physical world, there was no physics to do the explaining. And so he, he then proceeded to explain that he was really moved to a point of, of thinking deeply about religious faith, because whereas the evidence was pointing unequivocally in one direction, he didn't want it to be so. And then he began to, th he, said, he explained that he began to think about, well, what is it about me that doesn't want this to be so? I've always prided myself on, his, on my objectivity. It was a very compelling story. In the very next panel, there was a similar intellectual conversion announced by a leading origin of life researcher who worked on this problem of abiogenesis named Dean Kenyon. And Kenyon announced at, in, on the panel, he also surprised people by sitting on the side with the theists and explained, he argued that the, the discovery of the information bearing properties of DNA, everything that, that Crick had anticipated, um, suggests that the, what he called the natural theological question should now be reopened by the philosophers. In other words, we may as scientists be looking at evidence for the existence of God in the inner workings of the cell. And so I'm, you know, 27 years old. I'm kind of blown away at this. It was clear to me that the theists seemed to have the intellectual initiative in the discussion, that the people defending chemical evolutionary theory had nothing to offer except promissory notes that maybe we'll figure it out down the road. So I, I, got, it, I got really seized with this. I was working with uh, doing digital signal processing of seismic data, which was an early form of information technology, and the thought that the discovery of information inside cells was the holy grail of the origin of life problem, just absolutely seized me. I got really fascinated with that. I met a, another scientist who was on the panel that day named Charles Thaxton, who'd written a, a recent book called Myst The Mystery of Life's Origin. He happened to be living in Dallas. I started having long conversations with him after work. A year later, I was off to grad school and realized, I want to work on this origin of life problem. Well, it's, I, I guess it was uh, from in your book and in Thaxton and Piercy's book, that uh, I bumped into the idea. And, and I just find it fascinating the way information travels or doesn't travel. I mean, that something might be true, but if nobody knows that it's true, what, what does it matter that it's true? Because everybody, they haven't, you know, they never got the memo. And the idea that somehow in the 19th century and obviously into the 20th century, people come to, came to see faith as being at odds with science, rationality as being at odds with religious faith. And this becomes kind of baked into the way people think, including Einstein and uh, Sandage. And everybody seems to know that that's a fact. It, it's, it's the all, I call it the all reasonable people agree phenomenon. Yeah. We have that all over the place yeah, in the academic this, culture. Exactly. But out of the 19th century, all reasonable people seem to agree that science undermines belief in God well, and supports a kind of materialistic worldview, which then becomes the, the backdrop, the, the background assumption that people appropriate in doing science. And you may remember that quote from Richard Lewinton in the New York Review of Books, where he said, you know, we stand for science in spite of it, some of its most, uh, you know, counterintuitive constructs and some of its absurd formulations. And he's talking about things like the, probably the multiverse and things like that. But we stand for it because we cannot let a divine foot in the door, he said. He was very explicit right. about the idea that science has to presuppose materialism right. and only invoke materialistic explanations at all costs. Well, that, that's, wh that's why I was bringing this up, because I thought to myself, so th that's where we are, and it's where we've been you know, since the, the 19th century. But it was, in, in reading your book and then the book that Thaxton and Nancy Piercy did about 20 years ago, that I was reminded, or maybe learned for the first time, I can never remember, but th the idea is that we have forgotten that it was Christian faith that led to what we call modern science and the scientific revolution. There's no debating that. You don't have to like it. It could make you grumpy, but it is history. There's no way around it. And non-Christians have written about it. You quote them 
Uh, Joseph in, Needham. In your book, yeah. Al, uh, A.N. Uh, North, uh, Alfred North Whitehead. I mean, many of the leading uh, historians, Herbert Butterfield, uh, uh, leading historians and historians of science in the 20th century, really rediscovered this in the wake of that conflict historiography, the idea that science and religion are at odds. And, um, and, and they, they highlighted a number of factors, but there were presuppositions that came out of a Judeo-Christian worldview in particular. Um, our, 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 our friends in the Muslim world also had uh, uh, some contributed to science as well, but out of the Abrahamic faith, but particularly in the period of the, the scientific revolution, ideas coming out of the Hebrew Bible that were being rediscovered by the reformers and, and a strain of thought in late medieval Catholicism kind of combined to make this, this scientific revolution possible. What kind of presuppositions? Things like the intelligibility of nature, that nature can be understood because the same rational intellect that made nature made our minds and gave us the gift of rationality that would enable us to understand the reason that was built into the, into the world. The idea of the order of nature, but also the idea that the order of nature is contingent on the will of the creator, that it could have been different. There's a lot, I used to use a paintbrush to illustrate with my students. You've got 15 different kinds of paintbrushes. They all do the same basic job, but they all are, are different in ways, and the one the painter uses is up to the painter's own choice. And so Newton discovered that gravity has an inverse square law, but it might have been an inverse cube law, or it may have been a strictly linear relationship or something else. So there's an order there, but not an order that we can deduce from first principles, okay. which is what your right. friends, the and, Greeks, thought. And that, and, right, that's yeah. what I, this is what I find so interesting. And again, I'm just, I'm just familiar enough with this information to be dangerous with people who don't know more than I do, right? <laughs> and so I, I, so I picked up a lot of this from, from you and, and put it in my own book because I... You almost can't believe it when you see it. You think, how have I internalized some of this baloney that faith might be at odds with science? Not only is that not true, the opposite is true. We would not have modern science if not for devout Christians being Christian. It's not like to the side of their Christianity. Their Christian thinking led them to this. And you're getting to the idea now that um, you know, part of what it means to believe in the God of the Bible is to believe in a personal God. Aristotle didn't believe in a personal God, and so you get all of these the, Aristotelians the, the, right. in the late medieval world who have, they have an Aristotelian worldview which pushes against the idea of a quirky personal God. And so they insist that the planets you know, have to be moving in circles, because circles are perfect, and we know that, but what if a quirky personal god said, no, I'm going to I prefer I'm gonna ellipses, ellipses. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Uh, um, Which he did, and, and as you're it right. happened. The, 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 the Greeks had this idea of the logos, an impersonal logic. And because it pervaded all of nature in their view, then whatever was logical uh, to, seemed logical to us must be the logic that's built into the world. So it implied, right. it, it allowed for a kind of reliance on armchair philosophizing when what was necessary was empirical investigation. Robert Boyle was famous for saying, it's not the job of the natural philosopher, which was what they called scientists at the time, to ask what God must have done, but instead to go and look and see what he actually did do. And that was the spirit of the scientific revolution. Let's go and look and see. Well, and, and, and the other part of it that brings in the faith is the humility to say that uh, we may think we know what it is, but we know we're sinners, we know we get stuff wrong, we're going to force ourselves to actually look. The, the great historian of science, uh, uh, Peter Harrison, has emphasized this. This is a contribution of, in particular, the Reformation thinkers, because by emphasizing the depravity of man, ironically, they help make science possible. And the connection there is that, that yes, we can understand the order and design and the, and, 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 uh, the rationality built into nature, but we're also prone to flights of fancy, jumping to conclusions, that our, our, our cognition is also affected by the fall. And so we have to check our ideas, our theoretical ideas, against reality. And that also gave an impulse to, for empirical investigation and the whole program of, of experimentation. Right, it's called the scientific method. And it's kind of funny to me. When, when I you know, discovered this, obviously more recently than you, but it's astonishing how clear it is and how inextricably intertwined Christian faith is 
with science. So the fact that we're living in this world that pretends like Christians are somehow, you know, off against science, you know, not only is that not true, but exactly the opposite is true. Well, just to name one example that's to me particularly inspiring is the, um, the Principia that was the, the book about universal gravitation by, written by Newton, and the later theological epilogue called the General Scolium that he added to that, where he reflected on the, uh, the, the idea that God was the, the, the unseen force that enforced this order behind everything, but, and the idea that in God all things are held together or consist. And also, in that epilogue, he also made uh, 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 design arguments. Uh, this most beautiful system of sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. That's right in Newton. That's right in the general scolium to the Principia, arguably the greatest work of physics ever written, or one of the top three or four and at, at the very least. It's, it's incredible how deeply uh, integrated the theological perspective was into the scientific work, so much so that Rodney Stark, the uh, historian of science from Baylor who wrote the great book, uh, For the Glory of God, with Princeton Press, titled the book, For the Glory of God. For him, that, he realized that that was the motivation of these early scientists. I want to ask you more about the reaction to your book, because uh, it's just fascinating to me that, that, that someone like you, you, you put these books out there, and uh, by God's grace, enough people see them and read them. They don't, they're not just out there and nobody sees them. So there has been reaction. Some of it is respectful, like you mentioned Michael Shermer, but others have been, I, I think some people, ultimately they're just angry because you're, the, the, what you write is very compelling and they, they kind of can't bear it. So they have to come up with something. So what has the reaction been? What are people like Lawrence Krauss or others saying, uh, or have they bothered to respond? Well, interestingly, that kind of angry reaction mainly occurs on my Facebook page. <laughs> I don't know what, the, it just seems to attract trolls, you know, so. Yeah. Um, but, um, uh, well, interestingly, Krauss and I had a, an exchange in uh, the journal Inference, edited by uh, David Berlinski, about the fine-tuning issue. And Krauss actually, uh, after having, we've had some, you know, spirited debates in the past that have been a little, a little spicy, but uh, he, he paid me at least a backhanded compliment, saying that my, my knowledge of the physics was, was, uh, was laudatory, he said. Uh, however, he disagreed about some things, and one of the things he, he argued was that the fine-tuning, this, this exquisite set of, per, the, the, this group of parameters that are exquisitely finely tuned to allow for the possibility of life against all odds, one, just one of them, the, the cosmological constant, that, that force its the outward pushing force of the universe is fine-tuned to one part in 10 to the 90th power. That's like, an, that's so insane that it's almost funny even if you start breaking down what that means, so we'll just skip that. Well, let me give you, I have a visual illustration I've been holding back to share uh -oh. with you. Yeah, all right. Okay. So to get the fine-tuning of the cosmological constant right would be equivalent to having a blind person floating in free space looking for one marked elementary particle but not just one in our universe, but in 10 billion universes our size. That's okay, how lucky the person is. particle we're talking. A quark or an electron, yeah. So there's 10 to the 80th of them. So you're looking for one in the universe, one in, in this universe, yeah. but no, not this universe. We have how to many? include 10 others to get the odds right, the ratio. How right. many universes? 10 billion. 10 billion yeah. universes. Because we got 10 to the 80th elementary particles in our universe, but there's, the fine-tuning is 10 to the 90th. It's 10 orders of magnitude more acute than that. So that's just one In other parameter, words, one parameter. good luck. Yeah. So there's, there, there's, there's, there's lots of these fine-tuning parameters that are independently but, set. But, but Steve, this is what science says. In other words, science says, was it uh, Stephen uh, Weiner? Weiner? Weinberg. Weinberg, yeah, right. He was the one. He did a lot of work on these fine-tuning stuff. That said, yeah, yeah. these are the odds. Yeah. That, that the, that the fine-tuning of the, the, the cosmological right. constant is this. Right. It's breathtaking. So I'll, I'll tell you Krauss's, Krauss's okay. counter-argument. Yes. So I'm, I'm arguing, like Luke Barnes and other Polkinghorne, many physicists have argued, fine-tuning points to a fine-tuner. Um, Krauss's response is to say, well, not so fast. Uh, 
Instead, I th it's just as possible that, the, that life could have evolved to match the fine-tuning parameters that were already there, instead of the fine-tuning parameters being set in advance to make it possible for life. OK, that sounds like he's totally blowing smoke. I mean, no, and honestly, it sounds like preposterous. Well, a, uh, I'll, I'll tell you why. If, if you're talking about small things, like whether you know, life is carbon-based or silicon-based, it's like, OK, you can have a conversation. But when you're talking about the existence of the universe with planets and stars and so on and so forth, you, you couldn't have any possibility well, that, of that, life. Well, that's the rub. It, it's, it's a response that could possibly be true. It could be that life evolved in accord with the constraints of the fine-tuning parameters. But the problem is we can't even get basic chemistry or anything more than a, 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 a black hole unless some of these parameters are set just right from the very well, that, beginning. I mean, that's what I'm saying. So yeah. let's say you have, no, you, if things weren't perfect, perfectly fine-tuned, you do not have stars, which are, are, are creating elements, and you don't, you, you don't have any of that. Well, let's so talk how about in the that. World yeah, can that's... somebody like, like uh, Lawrence Krauss make a statement, this kind of blithe statement? He, he knows that. Well, I, d I did press him on this. That might, might be why I got the backhanded compliment. I'm not sure. But, I mean, it, it's a really, it's an interesting question in physics. If that cosmological constant isn't fine-tuned just right, if the universe is blowing up too fast, we get a heat death. Too slow, we get a big crunch. If we get either of those cases, we don't get, the, we don't get rocky planets and galaxies and even basic chemistry going. If the, if the mass of the quark isn't fine-tuned within very narrow tolerances, it's this, this, this Goldilocks universe idea that the physicists are talking about, that all these parameters are set just right. If they were a little bit different, no life. In the case of the, the mass of the quark, we wouldn't, even, we wouldn't get any atoms heavier than helium. You can't make anything out of hydrogen and helium alone. You've got to have the, more, the, larger, uh, the, the atoms with larger atomic structure. You've got to have carbon and oxygen and things like that to make anything interesting. So the evolution of life... The origin and evolution of life depends on prior fine-tuning. You can't get to, you, you got to have chemistry before you can talk about life. You got to have a, a planet where you can put it. All those things only happen if you first get fine-tuning. So I think Krauss's argument is clever. It could possibly be true in some possible universe, but it's not true in ours. I, I just have to believe these guys are too smart to really believe. I mean, I just, you know, I don't have the, the patience that you do. It just sounds so silly that, that, that they are saying things like this. You, you um, I mean, I just think that it's looking so bad for their worldview that they're getting desperate, that they're coming up with stuff. Um, what you mentioned, uh, Francis uh, Crick, he, I, I guess it must have been around 1973 or 80, 80, 80, Well, first in 73 and then in 81. Well, when he talks yeah. about panspr right, directed right, right. panspermia, it's so ridiculous. Talk a little bit about that. Now, well, you're asking somebody, hey, how did life form? How did life come into being? And this super genius scientist says, well, we don't know. And, but then he says, but we think maybe it came from someplace else, like, and just ended up here. And you think, well, that's not the question. <laughs> the, the, the question is, how did this it This has been formulated as a somewhat serious proposal by several scientists. Uh, Crick did write about it in a technical paper, I think it was 73, and then in his little book, Life Itself. It was published in, in a journal called Icarus. Th which that's I exactly find right. That's, very, yeah, per, yeah. A, very aptly named. Yeah. And uh, then in, in 81, he wrote this little book, Life Itself, where he floated this idea that, that yeah, he said, getting all the conditions just right on planet Earth are, are, are so improbable that it's almost equivalent to something like a miracle. And so then he said, so maybe it didn't happen here. And maybe it happened somewhere else, that life arose in some other prebiotic soup on some other planet where the, the conditions were more favorable and it evolved to a, a sophisticated, intelligent form of life that then seeded life to planet Earth. He later kind of regretted that and, and, and pulled back a little bit and said, I'm not going to, I'm not, because it, he, it was ridiculed a bit, and he said, I'm not going to speculate on the origin of life problem anymore. 
Dawkins then did in the film with Ben Stein in 2008. I think he later regretted it as well. But he suggested that maybe there was a signature of intelligence in the cell. Dawkins, or, uh, ben Stein got him to admit that neither he nor anyone else knew how life had first arisen from the, from the prebiotic chemical uh, state. Um, and then he said, well, and then Dawkins said, well, what, or Stein said, what do you think the odds are that intelligent design played some role? And he said, well, it could be, but it would have to have happened in the following way, that there was a, an alien intelligence. Okay, so what do we make of all that? Obviously, there's a problem with that in that if you have an alien intelligence seeding life on Earth, that that alien intelligence itself has to evolve, which means that someplace along the line, you've got to generate genetic information for building the first cell that could get that evolutionary process going. So the, all they, they, they haven't kicked the, the can down the road. They've kicked the problem out into space right. without answering it. But, but I guess what, what fascinates me uh, is just it strikes me as just deeply dishonest. It's like somebody brings in uh, a dessert, right? And... I say, wow, that's an amazing dessert. Who made that? And they say, oh, no one made it. It just exists. It just kind of came into being. And you'd say, well, that, that's ridiculous. Look at the dessert. It's obvious that someone made that. And then they would kind of go, uh, 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, I think somebody down the road ma made it. I think somebody down the road. That doesn't really answer the question they're just, they're just saying, we don't know, but we don't want to say we don't know, so we're just going to say it came from some other place. And it, it's completely besides the point. Nobody cares where it came from. We're simply asking, how did it happen? So if it happened down the hall or in another universe, well, and this, how, this how do you the... get life from non-life? And they completely avoid that. And yeah. I, I guess I feel like they have, to, they have to know that they're avoiding the question. Well... I, I, I'm reluctant to say it's dishonesty because I, again, am very sensitive to just how powerful presuppositions are in people's thinking. And if you are bound or constrained by a materialistic world outlook, such that you think that everything came about by undirected materialistic processes, then something like the panspermia idea or the multiverse may be your best option. With the multiverse, we have the same kind of problem where the fine-tuning is, is incredibly improbable. There's no way it would happen it, 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 by undirected processes in our universe. So, so serious physicists have posited the existence of other universes and, and, and such a large multiplicity of other universes that eventually a universe like ours would, they say, have to arise. Right. But then as you dig deeper into this, you discover there's a problem. And that is that if these other universes were just causally all disconnected from one another, then something that happens in Andromeda universe or universe X isn't going to affect anything in our universe, including the, whatever process it was that set the fine-tuning. So in virtue of that, they propose a, a universe-generating mechanisms that underlie all the universes that could be spitting out universes here, hither, and yon such that they could then portray our universe as a kind of lucky winner in a giant cosmic lottery. And that's where it all kind of falls apart, because it turns out that even in theory, the universe-generating mechanisms that have been proposed, some based on something called string theory, and another one based on something called inflationary cosmology, these other universe-generating mechanisms themselves depend on prior, unexplained fine-tuning. And we're right back to where we started, without any explanation for where the fine-tuning came from. And yet in our experience, we know that finely-tuned French recipes or radio dials or computer code always comes from an intelligent agent, as does information. So these, these features that are, that are tripping up the materialists are things that, based on our own experience, are always generated by minds, by intelligent agents. And, that, and for that reason, I think they give a very strong signal of design. I guess I wonder where this is headed. In other words, you, you've written a number of you know, I can say important, uh, well-received books. Uh, you're not the only one. Uh, people are, are writing about these things. And it strikes me, uh, as somebody who doesn't have a PhD in science or even the philosophy of science, as a layman, it strikes me that the, the end of of this uh, monopoly, in a sense, that, that this ideological monopoly is, is at hand. And the only question is, what, 
what are folks going to do about it? And you're, you're talking a little bit about some of them are kind of scrambling and coming up with really, really crazy ideas based on, uh, let's be honest, it's one thing to say uh, there are problems with it, but, but let's, let's go before that. And let's just say there's also zero scientific evidence for these propositions. I it's complete right. yeah. flights of fancy. Yeah. So there's a desperation. So are you seeing, is there an openness among some, I think you touched on it earlier, who, who, are, who are beginning uh, to think differently, like fundamentally differently about these questions? I, I think, no question, I think you put your finger on something, a really interesting intellectual phenomenon, which is that scientific atheism, which seems such a, a juggernaut, even 15 years ago with the publication of all those books, now uh, I think is starting to get really weird because the, 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 the scientific atheists are forced to hypotheses like the multiverse or the simulation hypothesis or, or the, the universe from nothing idea or, or the alien designer idea. This is, the, this is the extent to which people committed to a materialistic worldview must go in order to make some sense of semblance of the data. But the theories are getting really convoluted and exotic and transparently, uh, in some cases, transparently absurd. But Alan Sandage, like literally 40 years ago, uh, and he was the, the, he's yeah. the astronomer that you mentioned earlier who, who became a Christian, but, but he was on to this like literally 40 years ago. He, he was saying that some of these uh, hypotheses uh, and some of these conversations, they struck him as as ridiculous that yeah. they, they they were that they were blowing smoke that they were just using t- kind of you know uh, entree new terminology and and again that's that's sort of forty years ago so I guess I just yeah, we wonder... sometimes call it word salad where you, you, know, you just obscure the fact that you don't know with a lot of jargon well yeah. I mean the term multiverse theory yeah. uh, directed panspermia like it's 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 like something out of a Dr Seuss book or something it's just kind of you, you, you come up with a really crazy theory, and then you give it some name, and then you tell everybody, well, we're going we're gonna to talk about this now, okay? But if you have some common sense, you say, that, that doesn't make sense. It seems like you're, you're really stretching. So I guess what well, I'm wondering yeah. is, what would it take? What we're really talking about, Stephen, is what would, what would it take to, to, to shift a paradigm? This is a deep paradigm. A lot of people have everything invested in this. Careers, everything. Billions of dollars. What does it take? Uh, It's not an easy thing. Well, uh, to your earlier question, I think we are seeing significant intellectual conversions. The story of my book is, over the last 100 years, a story of many conversions. Einstein's away from strict materialism. Uh, Hoyle to a sort of quasi-theism. Dean Kenyon from Origin of Life uh, leading figure to proponent of intelligent design. In recent years, uh, the, the paleontologist Gunter Beckley, the very prominent German paleontologist who's embraced the theory of intelligent design, um, and many other examples I could give. But I think in the history of science, you see major paradigm shifts or shifts in research program and focus coming as a rising generation comes on the scenes and says, hey, there's some interesting, important questions that aren't being addressed by the old guard. There's a new way of looking at things. And I think, I think that's starting to happen. We have tremendous uh, energy surrounding the, the summer programs we put on, the network of young scientists that we tend around the world internationally, the, uh, the research projects that we're now involved with in mainstream universities with young postdocs working under senior mentors who have come to the intelligent design position uh, in biology. I think there's a lo- been a lot of interest in the in the, 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 the theistic implications of physics and cosmology for a longer time than that. So I, I think the shift is already taking place. I'm, I'm bullish. I'm not at all uh, downtrodden about the prospects. And uh, so uh, there is an old saw that uh, from Thomas Kuhn, I think, the great uh, Harvard historian of science who wrote The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, says that scientific revolutions occur one funeral at a time. Uh, it's a, a <laughs> little macabre. Good. We're not wishing... Uh, that fate on anyone, but th- it is the idea that the, as the younger generation rises, you get a, you get a turnover. As the, you know, if you get new evidence coming online that the older generation isn't taking into account, 
younger people are, are sooner or later going to press them on that. And I think that's happening. Well, um, so yeah, where do, where do we go from here? I mean, it, it, it makes a lot of people uncomfortable to, to think that uh, God is real. And because the, people seem intuitively, and this almost tells you, it, it, it does tell you something. that How is it that people intuitively know that if there is a God, that means something personal? Like, it, it, it's, it's not just theory. It, the reason I don't like it is because it would affect me somehow. And I think that's part of, you know, whenever you're talking about why ideas are accepted or not accepted or whatever, that, that is human nature. We just have to, as we much have to as, take human motivation into account for sure. Um, well, obviously, I think the, the God question is one of intense interest for most thinking people. Does my life have a purpose beyond this short time on Earth? Uh, the answer to that depends upon whether or not there's someone else there who created us and who can live beyond the time that we're here on Earth. And uh, there was this popular book years ago, the, A Purpose Driven Life. And you know, I used to say, you can't have a purpose driven life unless there is a purpose driven creator behind it all, that there's an ultimate purpose to our lives beyond that point at which we expire on this planet. So I, mean, I think these are deep existential questions that we all ask. Uh, you know, Viktor Frankl had that amazing title, you know, Man's Search for Meaning. I think we all search for that. Uh, in a par on a parallel track, I think, recovering the notion that God is responsible for, that he's the creator, the, the designer of the, of, the, of the beautiful physical and biological worlds in which we live, I think can help reignite interest in science. Uh, if you go back to figures like Kepler and Boyle and Newton, uh, William Harvey, whose statue I saw last week uh, in Cambridge, who invented the or discovered the circulation of the blood. All these people were deeply motivated to learn how the world worked and where it came from because they believed that it had been created by God. And so belief in God wasn't a science stopper, as we sometimes hear, people with all these worries about God of the gaps. Newton invented the calculus, the binomial theorem. He did original work in optics. He invented the laws of, he developed the laws of motion. He it, it, it developed the first universal theory of gravitation and so much more. And he was clearly motivated by his desire to give glory to God by revealing, the, as his title said, the principles of nature that were, were, were built into it. So I think in addition to this, the, the scientific rediscovery of God, I think, can open up the possibility of finding ultimate personal meaning for each of us as we seek to know that, our creator, the person who made us and all things. But it also, I think, can inspire us to do better science. It's a both and, not an either or. Good. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we, we don't have a ton of time left. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you, I don't know if you can sum these up, but uh, the philosopher and humanist James Croft uh, offered what you describe as an aggressive critique of your book on philosophical grounds. I'm just curious, what was that? Oh, it was an interesting debate because um, I was actually on uh, a vacation at, at a little cabin and people in Britain that I knew told me they'd set up an interesting conversation about my book with, with the philosopher who was interested. And I said, in person? Oh. Yeah, I, well, by Zoom. Everything oh, by was Zoom, Zoom in the, you know, the COVID days. So I got on and I was in a uh, a rustic old sweatshirt and jacket and thought it was just an informal... Well, this philosopher had come loaded for bear with uh, Who PowerPoints. Who friends that s set this up Yeah, for right, you? right. <laughs> and uh, it was a let's you and him fight conversation. So anyway, he had a, a number of technical objections. The main one was the idea that you couldn't really infer the activity of a designing intelligence in the past unless you had knowledge that there was such a being, you already had knowledge that there was such a being there, okay? And there is a sensible, there's something sensible behind that objection because when we infer or when we uh, retrodict a, the action of a cause in the past, it's helpful if we know both that the cause in question has the power to, to, to produce the effect we're trying to explain, but that we have independent knowledge that the, ca that the, the, the cause, the causal 
agent or entity was actually present. We have both those things that we can feel very solid. Well, make, that would be nice. Be but nice. If you don't. But, you're but you can't still always do that. To figure it out. But there's also a way to circumvent this, and this happened to be what, one of the key elements of my my PhD is that, in the case that you know that there's only one known cause of a given effect, if it's true that where when there's smoke there's always fire, you can infer fire definitively even if you don't have independent knowledge of the fire if you just see the smoke wafting up over the hillside. Okay, so when, the, when the, the, the cause that you're trying to infer is a necessary cause, it's the only known cause of the effect, you can make very definitive retrodictive inferences from effect back to cause. And so he posed this as an objection to the argument from information in DNA and said, well, you don't have independent knowledge of a designer. And I said, we don't need to. Because in this case, there's only one known cause of the production of large amounts of digital information, and that is an intelligent mind. And then I used a little illustration to get the point across. I said, imagine you went to Antarctica, and you were assuming, like all other archaeologists, that there'd never been life, uh, there'd never been any life on the planet or on that continent. But then, you know, you, you got deep into an ice cave and got, got deeper in, and there was, you know, there, you got all the way to the rock. And lo and behold, there were inscriptions on, on there dating from you know, uh, two million years ago. What would you now infer? Well, you didn't have any independent knowledge that, there were, that Antarctica had ever been inhabited. But if you have in, informational inscriptions in, in, uh, carved into the rock, you're going to have to change your opinion. So why? Because information is a distinctive diagnostic of intelligent activity. There's only one known cause of the production of information. So that's what our little argument was about. And I had to sort of suddenly it's just fun. it's recall funny all this how on vacation. What everybody sort of, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, you know, I, I think we all know what you just said intuitively, even if we've never heard the term retrodictive before. <laughs> um, but when you're talking to a philosopher like that, you, you know, get you, words you, like this. You have yeah. to, you, yeah. you have to, resorts to those words to explain what most people know. Well, James, um, James was an interesting guy. He was a secular humanist clergyman at a congregation in, I think, St. Louis. He'd done a Harvard PhD in philosophy, British-born. So we had a lot in common, except that we were on opposite sides of the issue. Right, yeah. right. Um, I'm uh, not a secular humanist clergyman, but he was, you know, oh. interested enough in religion to be a clergyman, yeah. although a different kind of religion. Yeah. You, you, you also mentioned... Um, Roger, Roger Penrose's new cosmological model, uh, and some people have been posing it as a challenge to the cosmological argument for the existence of God. Can you explain what I just said? <laughs> it's, it's been one, uh, it's, uh, one of the things that was raised in opposition to the argument of the book is that there are some newer cosmological models than the ones that I addressed in the book. I addressed the Big Bang, the steady state, the oscillating model, and the, the, probably the hottest topic in theoretical physics and cosmology is this idea of quantum cosmology, and I had three chapters on that at the end. It's the Krauss universe came from nothing idea, and um, let's not get into it, it's heavy. But the, the newer thing that came up was um, something from Sir Roger Penrose it's called the cyclical conformal cosmology, big, big words. Um, but it's, it's a variant off of the earlier oscillating universe idea, the oscillating universe had the universe expanding in the present time, in the forward direction of time, but eventually recollapsing, right. and then bouncing and recollapsing and bouncing an infinite number of times. So it was a way of explaining the observation that the universe is currently expanding, without, but still holding on to an infinite universe. Okay. And the problem with that idea was exposed, a number of problems. One is there's not enough matter to cause a recollapse. But number two, even if there were boun subsequent bounces, with each, ex each time the universe expands, the energy of expansion is sort of creating greater entropy or disorder in the universe. And so with each cycle, there's less energy available to do work. And so it'd be like a bouncing ball. Eventually, even if you had a, a, a cycle of expansions and contractions, the ball would eventually damp out and, and you'd run out of steam. And since we don't live in a universe like that, you can infer that the universe hasn't been around an infinitely long time. Um, Penrose has offered a modification of that idea. Instead of having an infinite number of uh, expansions and contractions, he envisions the universe expanding outward, and then through an unknown force he calls the, uh, or an unknown field called a phantom field, 
he imagines that a new universe would bust out of a little patch of that universe and would, and at that point, this phantom field would spontaneously um, uh, decrease entropy, so there'd be more order and more energy available to, to do work, but only at the place where the, uni- uh, where the universe was, was, new universe was sprouting from. Now, some, one of his colleagues at Oxford has actually critiqued this idea because he said there's no physical field that has the attributes of a Penrose phantom field. Uh, because what the phantom field does is it spontaneously creates order out of disorder in just the right place at just the right time and causes an abrupt change of state, literally a creation event of a new universe. So you can get around the God hypothesis, but only by positing a physical field that has the powers of agency, that has God-like powers. So that's the trick. This is what I... I I mean, ultimately... uh, this is fun, uh, at least for me, because I, I, you see, um, in a way, you see these patterns, right? You, you, you see people desperately looking for ways around what you can't get around, and they are very uh, intelligent and creative. Um, but at the end of the day, you've got this problem called reality, created by, you know, the Lord of Hosts. And you just keep bumping up against it. So it's sort of funny to see where, where we are now and, and who is willing to kind of face it and, and, and who isn't. But I, I'm not as literary as you are, Eric, but I did have one line in my book that, that I thought, well, that's pretty literary, uh, where I was telling the story about Einstein and um, his fiddling with the cosmological constant to portray the universe as static. And then I said, but the heavens talked back. And the evidence became what determined the outcome of the, of the theorizing. And I think, in a sense, the, the heavens, the digital code, the fine-tuning of the universe, the planetary fine-tuning, the, all the anthropic biological parameters that our, our colleague Michael Denton is writing about, I mean, there's so much evidence that's pointing towards a purposive uh, universe that was designed and created by a pers- purpose of intelligence, it does get hard to, to, to ignore it. So say that again, the heavens... The heavens talked back, I the said. The heavens Einstein. talked back, yeah. and that's original with you. Well, well done, Stephen Meyer. Pretty, yeah. Come on, <laughs> come on. Everybody says he's dumb. He's not dumb. Uh, you, it's such a joy. Most of my sentences are a lot longer than that. <laughs> right. so, yeah. We got that one out in polished. Ock- Occam's it. razor. Yeah. You got to yeah. get them down. Got to get them down. Nice my, and elegant. My, short. my wife uh, edited my last book, and she had a little a little acronym HLS, which was hellishly long <laughs> sentence. So. Right. Uh, well, Steve, Stephen, I just want to say honestly um, how uh, I- important your writing and, and your, your friendship and these conversations have been to me um, in my own path, as I said at the beginning of, of this, because I really do think that um, uh, God is, is, is using you in some extraordinary ways, and, and writing these books is just part of it. Uh, b- before we go, let me just ask you briefly, um, are there any plans to, you know, get this information out there, uh, films or, or anything like oh, that? Oh, thank you. Our producers would actually want me to give a plug. We are working on a feature-length documentary based roughly on the story of the book, though it will be titled something different, probably uh, something like The Story of Everything. How about The Heavens Talk Back? Well, we could, we could work on that. Oh, the Heavens Talk Back. You better... You better use it for something because I'll, or I'll steal it because it's very good. It's very good. Uh, folks, join me uh, in thanking the Discovery Institute and Stephen Meyer in particular for what, at least for me, has been a lot of fun and more than fun. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you.